don't touch. I will not touch mine. No, your recording's pretty much like the volume's perfect. So okay. Sorry, does my voice sound okay? I still got a bit of a sore throat. So apologies to you and everyone else listening. Oh, are you feeling better? Um, it's mm, it's probably it's the same as yesterday. It's a bit scratchy. So sometimes when I'm talking, I might suddenly be like. <laughs> so I apologize <laughs> if that happens. We can edit Just, that out for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so you had your tea though. So you sound fine. You don't sound so raspy. So that's good. Okay. Then maybe it is going then a bit. So hey guys, welcome back to the Japan Archives. This is episode six. Now, Heather, how are you today? I'm doing pretty good. It strangely enough. So we didn't really have like the traditional June. To you, or rainy season,、uh, ours seems to be kind of delayed. So we have had a lot of sun, but last night we had a really strong thunderstorm and had heavy rain this morning. So it's been kind of a more quiet day, just because the of all the rain. Other than that, pretty all right. How about you? Ah,、uh, well, apart from the sore throat that we're still getting through, I'm doing okay. It's Exam times next week at school, so just prepping them with loads of revision material. So it's a bit busy. I'm trying to view new things as well with the classes, with like interactive activities. But they're responding well. They're enjoying the classes even more. So I think I'm going to keep up with it for sure. Ah,、oh, that sounds really exciting, and I, I definitely, as it keeps going, I need updates.、I、need updates. Yes, of course. Thank you. But anyway. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for tuning in again. This is episode six,、um, Lord of Rice, and I have decided today to tell Heather about a folk tale, a folk story. But if I told you the title, which in English is mostly translated as Lord of Rice, is it one you're familiar with? I am not. Okay. So this will be completely new. So that'll be interesting. That'll be good. But yeah, as you know, if you have any questions, just stop me. And、we can do with that as we go through. Absolutely, I'm ready. So, first of all, this folk story、um, is based on a real person、um, who was called Fujiwara no Hidesato. He lived around the 10th century in Japan, and he was part of the Fujiwara clan. And for Fujiwara, one of the more notable things that he achieved during his lifetime was in 940, where he put down a rebellion. By the Taira clan, which was led by、uh, Taira no Masakado. So that's a little bit about the real life character, but I want to move on to the folk tale, so more into the realms of make believe. The story starts with one day Hide Sato, who in some of the versions of the story is also known as Tawara Toda. But Hide Sato, he wakes up and he's decided that he wants to go on an adventure one day. So he packs up and he leaves. You know. Wanting to find an adventure to see what will happen, so he sets off and he walks and he walks for quite a long time until he reaches a bridge known as the Setano Karashi Bridge. This bridge was said to go all the way over Lake Biwa. So, quick question. Okay. Is this is this an actual bridge? Yes, it is. Oh. So yes, this bridge is real. So thank you for that question because I actually always assumed it was created for the story. But no, the Setano Karashi Bridge is actually one of well classed as one of the three famous bridges of Japan, and was even immortalized in a painting known as the Evening Glow at Seta, which was part of a collection of works known as the Eight Views of Omi, and it even has. Really early mentionings in the Nihongi, also known as the Nihon Shoki, which we've covered before, which details the myths and legends of the gods and goddesses of Japan. But over time, obviously, the bridge has been rebuilt. The one that's currently in existence was created by Oda Nobunaga. <gasps> Nobunaga, I. Do you know him? Yes, the very, very famous warlord of Japan. So there is an actual bridge by that name. Where is Lake Biwa? Okay, so like we said, the bridge goes across Lake Biwa. Lake Biwa, interestingly enough, is the largest freshwater lake in Japan and is located in Shiga Prefecture, which would be in like the west central area of Honshu. Oh, okay. So he's reached the bridge, which goes across the lake, and he finds out laying across the bridge is a giant dragon. And the, the dragon is so large it covers the in, entire span of the bridge. But obviously, 
Hidesato yearning for adventure. He isn't phased by the dragon. He isn't scared away. So he calmly walks over the dragon and carries on his way. But that is exactly what the dragon was waiting for. He was waiting for someone who was brave enough and confident enough to find him and walk past him with no fear. So the dragon then changes himself into a man, revealing himself to Hidesato as the Dragon King, the Dragon King of Lake Biwa. So did it say what happened if someone tried to fight the dragon or did people just walk away? It doesn't. In the story, it doesn't mention whether anyone tried to attack the dragon before or whether others turned up and ran away in fear. All it mentions is that Hidesato was the one to walk over the dragon and, you know, prove his fearlessness in a way. Hmm. I'm pretty impressed. I, I don't think I would see that long of a dragon and just try to walk by it. That's impressive. I like I like his uh, I like his character there. <laughs> He's got a lot of gumption. I think I for one would definitely just turn around and be like, nope. I'm going home. That's enough adventuring for one day. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. I think that would be me too. So the Dragon King has turned back into a man telling Hidesato he is the Dragon King that lives at the bottom of Lake Biwa and he asks him for his help. So basically near the lake there is a mountain called Mount Mikami which is where a giant centipede lives. Now the giant centipede was known as Seta. Ah uh, yeah Japan has some very large centipedes. Ugh. Yes. Mm. Is Mount Mikami an actual a mountain? Mount Mikami is a mountain in Japan. So a lot of this folk tale is actually relying quite heavily on actual real places. That's pretty exciting. I love that. Yeah, it draws upon a lot of places that the people of the time would be able to would know and be able to relate to. And especially as well in Japan, historically, it was a country where people believed in the supernatural. So to have a mountain you know and say that it is where a supernatural creature actually lived, most people at the time would genuinely believe that that was true. Um, but yeah, the mountain is quite a small mountain. It's only 400 and 30 meters tall. So he's beseeching Hidesato for his help because this centipede basically is plaguing him and his family. After he discovered the Dragon King's home underneath the lake, the centipede basically comes every night to take away members of his family. So the Dragon King is desperate for a hero to come and kill the centipede. So Hidesato in that moment obviously realizes that this would be an adventure, the adventure that he wanted. So he agrees and the Dragon King takes him to his palace underneath the lake to await the hour where the centipede would descend once more from the mountain and allow Hidesato his chance to fight and kill him. So naturally time passes and nighttime comes around and the centipede appears. So Hidesato takes out his bow and arrow ready to fight the creature. However, he only brought three arrows with him for his entire adventure, which I personally feel is a rookie mistake. When you're setting out an adventure, I would try and stock up on as many things as humanly possible. Uh, I, I think just, yeah, three arrows may be a distinct disadvantage. Three? It's, wow. No, that's not enough. <laughs> Oh my goodness. But nonetheless, that is all Hidesato <laughs> has upon him. And the first two, unfortunately, cause no damage to the creature. They they do hit him. They hit the creature right in the center of its head. But because of its the armor of its body, they merely bounce off, uh, causing the creature no damage. Exoskeleton. Yes, exactly, an exoskeleton. That was the word I was looking for. Yay, you're welcome. That's fine. I'm still I'm still caught up in the the Dragon King's family and three hour oats. I'm a, I'm a little bit behind today on all the questions I have. I am so sorry. Keep going. Well you can ask them at the end and we can stagger them in. Okay. The centipede draws closer. Obviously the first two hours have failed. And so now he's desperate to find a way to kill the centipede you know, to basically protect the Dragon King and his remaining family. Now, luckily, he does remember a way which would kill the centipede. He remembers 
in one of the final moments before the creature arrives that human saliva is quite deadly to all centipedes. So what he does, he takes the arrow tip in his mouth and wets it with his saliva. And after he has done so, he fires the arrow at the giant centipede. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Human saliva is deadly to centipedes. Is this actual scientific fact? Because this is this could be very useful for life here. So by the power of Google, to answer your question, Heather, because it was a very strange question that I'd never thought of, human saliva in itself is not toxic. However, the bacteria that we naturally have in our mouths could, in theory, carry bacteria that could make other animals sick. Okay, giant centipede comes in your house. Besides bug spray, like if you happen to be out, that could be a useful fact to know. So. I'm a, I'm a I'm tiny bit disappointed because I was picturing possibly like you know spitting on a centipede and having it expire without having to touch it or spray it. So I'm a little disappointed, honestly. <laughs> it would definitely make our lives easier, but no. At least according to a quick Google to answer this question, it doesn't look like our spit in itself could harm an animal, let alone a centipede. Okay, thank you for your like for your research. <laughs> 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 That's okay. So once again, the arrow hits its mark uh, in the center of the creature's head. But obviously this time, because he has wet it with his saliva, it kills the creature. And the creature dies and it collapses into the lake and, you know, stains the lake red with its blood as its body is floating on the surface. Oh, it's a lovely visual. Ugh. Yeah, Hide Sato has completed his adventure, and obviously the Dragon King is very grateful. So in thanks, he throws him a feast at the bottom of the lake, and asks if Hide Sato would actually like to remain there, stay in the palace with him, as his eternal gratitude. But Hide Sato declines the offer, and he leaves. <sighs> But because of this, the king doesn't want him... No, go on. No, I was going to ask, what do you... kind of food do you think is at a dragon king's feast? And would you want to eat it? I'm going to assume the feast was mostly fish. Hmm, well, at the bottom of the lake, that makes sense. Yeah, bottom of the lake, full of fish, there's probably a lot of seaweed maybe. So it was probably a sushi feast, Hmm. I think. Yeah. I, I think I might be tempted to stay. Oh, if sushi was an offer, I think I'd stay. Hmm. Not eternal sushi, though. <laughs> no, maybe change it up now and then. But I don't really know the logistics of cooking at the bottom of a lake. I'm assuming there's some magic involved with it. Unless everything is just raw. Mm, could be possible, too. So he declined to stay. But the Dragon King won't let him leave without some form of thanks. In the form of gifts. So he gives him five gifts to leave with. One of them being a large bronze bell. The second, a bag of rice. The third, a roll of silk. The fourth, a cooking pot. And then the fifth one, he was given a second bell. Now he does a few things with these gifts as they are quite magical. He donated the large bronze bell to the temple of Midera. Is there really a Midera temple? Now to answer your question, Heather, I have to say I'm a little disappointed in it. Because if you recall from episode two, <gasps> about the yokai Tesso. That monk lived in the temple of Midera. So a nice little callback to an earlier episode there. So he gives the bell to the temple, which was later the home of the monk that turned into the yokai Tesso. That was my intention all along to do the callback. Oh, really, was it? You were, you were pretending that you didn't know. Exactly. I'll believe you this one time. Magic. Okay. <laughs> So he's given the bell to the temple of Midera and the bag of rice he finds out is magical in that the bag never empties. He has a unlimited supply of rice. And the same with the roll of silk that he was given. No matter what he cuts off the silk, the silk roll in itself never grows any shorter. And with the cooking pot, anything he threw inside would ultimately end up cooking a delicious meal. And so, due to basically his unlimited food, his unlimited silk, his, you know, now amazing skills in cooking, he grew very wealthy from this because he had no need to really buy anything anymore. Was able to live out the rest of his life in comfort. Uh -huh. Oh, so I, I was wondering where the rice was coming into the story, and I'm guessing it comes from that bag of rice that never grew empty. 
Exactly. I definitely think that in the choice between having the never empty rice bag versus the never ending sushi buffet, I think I definitely think he picked the right choice. Yes, I I think he definitely picked correctly in his choices. Rice, dragon, centipede, delicious food. Well, what were your questions then? Okay, so the centipede is taking away members of the Dragon King's family. I was going to ask if Hide Sato would in eventually end up finding them, but it sounds like they possibly died because they did not come back. And how many members are in the Dragon King's family? How big is his family? How many nights has the centipede been taking this family away? So at least the version I have read doesn't state how many members of the family have already been taken. So I'm guessing it probably hadn't occurred for very long. I'm sort of hoping. No, I mean, you would hope not. Unless his family was exceedingly large, then yeah, you would have kind of hope that it hadn't been going on for too long and that quite a lot of his family were still surviving. There are some versions that do describe the centipede more in depth to give you an extent of its size. Some of the books say that the centipede itself coiled seven and a half times around the mountain that it lived upon. Oh, that sounds horrifying. So basically it's curling around Mount Mikami? Basically, yes. Do you think if the centipede had been on the bridge, Hire Sato would have crossed the bridge? I personally think he would. If he was fearless enough to walk over a dragon, I feel like he would be fearless enough to walk over a large centipede. Hmm. What about you? I'm still thinking about the centipede and I think all pr thought processes have been shut down because I'm thinking about a giant centipede. <laughs> I think that was my question. Yes, I think I'm good. Okay, cool. So that's my story for today at least. So I was wondering what poem you actually have for me today to listen to or song. Well, first of all, thank you so very much for the lovely folk tale. Very, very fun and very interesting. And I learned a lot. Um, so today I have a poem for you. It's actually a haiku. Okay, so what is the makeup of a haiku? So a haiku is a traditional form of Japanese poetry. It has three lines and it, it is five, seven, five syllables. And usually the lines don't rhyme. And most of the time they have something to do with nature or just, just different things about nature that may tie into life or situations or, you know, happiness or sorrow or seasons. The haiku I have from you is from an author named Basho. And I, I actually learned a lot about Basho, well, a little bit about Basho because of a movie. So there was a movie back, I think it was done around um, maybe, was it 1999? Yeah, it was 1999. It's called My Neighbors the Yamadas, and it's a Studio Ghibli movie. And I saw this fairly recently, actually. It's the first time I had seen it. Not one I've ever seen, if I'm honest. Actually, it's not one I've ever heard of until now. Yeah, a lot of people haven't heard of it. I mean, if, if you're in America or in the UK, you're going to hear about the big Studio Ghibli movies, you know, Spirited Away, My Neighbor Totoro, maybe Ponyo. This one was not quite as popular because it's more of a like slice of life kind of film. It's very kind of, you know, not so traditionally high action or supernatural. It's basically just a story about a family. Okay. It shows a lot of the relationship between family and family members. And I definitely recommend seeing it if you get a chance. It is very, it's more peaceful, but it's it's got lots of moments of humor and you Def definitely, you probably will notice some parallels between, you know, your family and their family, which I think what makes the movie so beautiful is that you can actually relate to it no matter what culture you are. Yeah. So is it a traditional type of Ghibli movie, like animated or did, because it's not as famous, is it because it's done differently? Yes, you're right. Nice question. So this movie was actually animated on computer. Oh, okay. So quite different then. Yeah, I believe it was the first one that was animated by computer. Yes, yeah, so it was the first Ghibli film to have animation drawings painted entirely on computers. And it's done in an art, an, a watercolor art style, um, which if you are familiar with more recent movies, it's Tale of Princess Kaguya. So Kaguya Hime is actually similar, that similar kind of watercolor art style. So this was done before um, Kaguya Hime. Or the tale of Princess Kaguya. 
Okay. So the poem from、um, Bashol that I chose is not actually from My Neighbor the Amadas. In that movie, a lot of Bashol's poetry is used to tell like the different sequence of stories that's in that movie. But I picked this one because it's summertime and it's really hot. <laughs> so who was Bashol? Like when did he live? Is he like a modern poet or like an older poet? So Bashol is definitely an older poet. He's not modern. He was. Born in 1644, so he is during the Edo period of Japan. Ah,、oh, well remembered. <laughs> I'm trying to learn. I'm working my best. <laughs> yeah, he's actually probably definitely one of the more famous、uh, haiku authors. Okay. So he is actually recognized as the greatest master of haiku. If you've experienced or if you read any haiku in Uh, in the UK, most likely it's a good chance it came from Bashol. His full name is Matsuo Bashol. Okay. Well, I have no more questions. So if you're happy to read the poem for me, I'm all ears. Natsu kakete, migatsu atsuki, suzumi kana. Did you hear it? Oh, sorry. I I thought I was expecting more, but obviously, yeah, you said it is a haiku, so of course it's going to be quite short. Sorry. It's okay. I was just sat here waiting for the second half. <laughs> <laughs> yes, haiku very five seven five, and you're done. <laughs> so, what would that translate to in English? I assume it will most of the time. If you do the translation, it loses the five seven five meter to it, or do they try to translate it to still fit? So I actually have. Two translations today, because the interesting thing about Japanese poetry is that sometimes there's not one translation. People who translate poetry sometimes interpret things a little differently. It can also depend on how you pronounce the words or how the words are written. There are sometimes. Some kanji can have different meanings, and if you put different kanji together, you can sometimes read them differently. So I actually picked out two interpretations because it's such a short、um, poem. The first one is, "Past summer, the full moon night is still so hot. I feel summer coolness." Okay. And the second translation is, "Still summer, the harvest moon too hot to enjoy the coolness." I do like both.、Mm. I'll be honest. If I had to pick one, I think I enjoy the second one more because it talks about the harvest moon. I think it gives me a better image in my head.、Mm, that's a good question. So, what's really interesting about the the first translation is that when I I go to read it, this the first one says past summer. So when you hear past summer, it sounds like it's headed toward oskimi, the you know the the full moon the. The full moon of autumn, the moon viewing, where you know the rabbit in the moon with the mochi. So I think it's actually more of a fall poem. And then when I read, you know, still summer, the harvest moon too hot. I think maybe it's possibly still is like around August time. So just that one word makes me think, oh, one's around September, one's around August. We always, we don't always get the exact meaning because sometimes the Meaning doesn't always translate the same. Or you're trying to find a word that's similar, but the nuance is just a little bit different. So I think that's why、uh, there's lots of discussions about poetry, especially when they've been translated, just because someone can see it one way and another person can see it totally different. But I think that's what's good about poetry, especially in Japanese. Like you said, a lot of words can. Have different meanings. Both in English, you could translate it with different words, but also in Japanese, I feel that sometimes the point was that it would be a bit ambiguous. Yeah, that's true. Like the not one of the more frustrating, but one of the more harder to grasp concepts that you know I'm learning as I'm I'm learning Japanese is that Japanese is not. Always, usually, not always direct. There's a lot that you say. You don't speak directly. You speak around. You imply, and that's a little more frustrating. And something that you know makes you know Japanese a little bit more difficult to learn is that things don't always mean what you think they might mean. And things that you think mean something, you probably shouldn't use those. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. Like sometimes there are things that are said that you know that that's they're trying to tell you something different. And it's also circling back. I also do like too that because there is possibly no exact meaning. I think sometimes reading the poem one day 
If you read it in a certain way, it could have one meaning for you. Then coming back a year later, reading that same poem again, reading it a little differently, you might need to have a different translation of it. You might need that different reading. Sometimes looking at something again with a little bit different meaning, it could help you or possibly give you some ideas or clarity or, or things you didn't notice before. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Well, thank you for the poem, Heather. It was, it was very interesting, and, and thank you for giving two different translations, because like you said, it was interesting to see how it could have such different meanings, but also very such similar meanings just to one poem. Yeah, I found it very interesting, so thank you. You're very welcome. But that's obviously everything from me. Um, do you have anything else to say before we check out? with today's episode? Well, it is summertime, so everyone, please stay cool, stay hydrated, wear sunblock, and enjoy lots of kakigori and ice cream. And if you can, go to the beach. Summer's the perfect time to go to the beach, especially near where I live. We have some pretty good beaches here in Chiba. But anyway, guys, thank you again for listening. Um, you've probably noticed by now that even though we initially started this project as a bi-weekly podcast. Lately, we've been doing it on a weekly basis. We wanted to just try it for a while to see how it goes. And we're having a lot of fun doing it every week. So we're hoping, at least right now, to continue this and have an episode for you every week. Yes, it's always really fun to talk to you, Thomas. I always enjoy it. So weekly is great for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I always... I do enjoy learning about the poems from you because you always find ones I've never heard of or, and people I've never heard of as well. So it's always interesting. But yeah, if you are interested in learning more about Japanese history, obviously you can head over to our database that we're trying to expand on a weekly basis. You can find that over at historyofjapan.co.uk. Um, we'll also be posting the show notes up there from now on for all the episodes. If you want to follow us on Twitter for updates on the database as we add more to it, you can find that over at, at a History of Japan. And if you're interested in seeing some of the pictures we take while we go out and explore Japan, you can find us on Instagram at nexus underscore travels. That's N-E-X-U-S underscore travels because as we tell you every week all our social media is different heather yes do you, don't you have a website that you've not told us about yet why indeed i do you can find my website at heatheroveryonder.com and you spell yonder y-o-n-d-e-r and what is your website about heather <laughs> uh, it's like i have a website okay <laughs> Heather, tell us, please. We need to know what it's all about. Now I'm going to catch my breath because I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> so my website is about, it's just observations and, oh, God. See, now you have to challenge me because now I have to come up with some kind of description. And Oh, there you go. Challenge given. Oh, challenge accepted. Oh, my goodness. So essentially, my blog is about life's little journeys everywhere. Mine right now happens to be in Japan, but I think anywhere you go, no matter where you are, even if you never leave your home country, you never leave your home city, you can still take a journey anywhere you go. So I invite people to come along with me on my journey, but I'm hoping everyone else has their own too. That's quite a sweet way of describing your website actually. It's very, it's very cute. But also very, like, meaningful, if that makes sense. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's okay. But yeah, once more, thank you very much, guys, for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And you'll no doubt be hearing from us again next week, where we'll have a new, a new nugget of Japanese history to tell you. And... Of course, a new poem or song, which Heather will surprise us with next week. <laughs> I'll try my best. <laughs> well, anyway, thanks for tuning in, guys. Speak to you next week. Bye. Matane. Did we do an intro? Not really. I forget. No. <laughs> I think we should do it now and I'll stick it back at the beginning. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. Let's do that now. Yay.